Welcome to the Power of Purity podcast, the show that empowers men to experience their sexual gift in a healthier way. Now here's your host, Tony Ingrassia. Hey guys, welcome back. I started sharing my story with you last time and I covered three stories. Number one was my family of origin. Number two was called Magazines and Books, which concerned my discovery of pornography as a boy and my earliest uh, experiences with pornography. And story number three was Risk to Peak. So I continue today with story number four, which I call Hurting My Body, and it concerns my discovery of masturbation as a boy. Before I discovered masturbation, I remember, I think, touching myself on occasion and feeling like sensations of pleasure, but never with such an incredible, uh, intense feeling uh, associated with it. And I remember the first time I actually had an orgasm, I felt this unbelievable, incredible, intense feeling of euphoria and ecstasy, unlike anything that I had ever felt before. And then on top of that, I quickly learned that this feeling could be replicated over and over again. Or in other words, I could do this as many times as I wanted to do it. And thus began an, an addictive behavior that I would struggle with really for years to come in my life. And I remember the very first time I ejaculated because I was literally terrified by the event. You see, I, I don't think anybody had talked to me about this. I, I don't remember expecting it. I, I didn't know what it was. And I for real thought that I had broken my body, that I had done something to harm myself. I'm not sure what I was thinking as a 10-year-old boy. I'm thinking maybe, you know, if you cut yourself, blood comes out of you, right? It means something's wrong. And all I knew is something came out of my body that that had never come out before. I didn't know what it it was, and, and I thought I had broken my body. I had harmed myself. I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And because of this, I was scared. And I wanted to run to my mom and and tell her, Mom, I I think I broke myself. I did something. Something's wrong. I didn't know if I had to go to the doctor or go to the hospital. But at the same time, I guess I was scared to go to my mom because I didn't do it. And I can only imagine it was because of this intuitive sense of shame. I I guess I knew if I go tell my mother, she's going to say, well, what were you doing? How did this happen? And how would I explain what I was doing? So I, I just, I, I, I couldn't tell my mom, even though I was scared and I didn't know what to do. But here's the punchline of the story, you guys, and why I really share this story is because I continued to masturbate in the days ahead. Even though I literally thought I was harming my body, I was hurting myself. I was doing something bad. I couldn't stop because I had discovered this feeling, this intense, wonderful feeling, and I I wanted to feel that feeling again. So I pursued it. I would continue to do this, even though I thought I was hurting my body. And I really think that these two stories together reveal something very significant that was going on in my young heart and life. Story number three, risk to peak. Story number four, hurting my body. You see, I was willing to take chances with my sexuality. When I knew that I shouldn't look at the porn because I might get caught because my mother was home, and when I thought that I was hurting my body but I continued to do this behavior anyway, you see, it speaks of me being compelled by sex. Sex was already gaining a significant power in my young life, in my young soul, And it was compelling me. It was uh, an authority in my life. It it, it was like taking over my life. And already sex was starting to control me instead of me controlling sex. And I think I see in these stories literally the seeds of my sexual addiction, of, of, of my inability to control sex. Already sex was gaining this authority and power in my young soul that would follow me for years to come. 
And that brings me to story number five, which I call ungodly role models. And I want to talk just a little bit about both uh, about two very significant men in my life, my physical father and a man that I might call my spiritual father. You see, the way God set this thing up, guys, is that masculinity is something that's caught. It's not taught. Uh, We don't necessarily teach young boys how to be men. We don't have classes where we send a boy and say, you know, go to this class. We're going to teach you how to be a man. The way this thing works is that it boys just watch the, the senior male role models in their life, presumably their father, their grandfathers and uncles, older brothers, maybe friends of the family, friends in the neighborhood, cousins. Boys watch uh, older male role models and they learn how to be men accordingly. I, I like the metaphor of a spill. You know, if, if, if you spilled a glass of milk on a table and you took a dry sponge and put it right in the middle of that spill, the sponge would very slowly just begin to soak up that spill, you see. And I think that's what a young boy's heart does. Uh, you, you put a boy in the midst of men, and that boy just begins to soak up masculinity. The boy is watching these men, and he's being taught, even though he doesn't know that he's being taught, And he's being taught, even though the men around him might not know that they're teaching this boy lessons. But this boy is watching and he's learning what what do men talk about? What do men say? What kind of jokes do men tell? Uh, How do men look at women? How do men talk about women? You see all these different lessons that a boy begins to to learn by by observing the, the male role models in his life. Well, I want to share one uh, specific story here concerning uh, what I call ungodly role models, and it's it's just a, a story about rabbit hunting. Uh, my dad was an avid outdoorsman. He loved to hunt and fish and stuff like that, and it's the one gift that my dad really gave me in my life and my relationship with him. He invited me into the world of men, and he started taking me hunting when I was just a boy. And uh, we we would go on these hunts, and it, it frequently would be myself and just a group of men. My dad had uh, up to eight and ten beagles when I was a kid, and it was my job to take care of the, the dogs, uh, feed them every day, and let them out of the kennel to run around in the yard and things like this. And my dad would go rabbit hunting every single Sunday during rabbit season. So it wasn't unusual for there to be four or five or six guys in the car, five, four or five grown men and one boy, and that one boy was me, Tony. So here we are on these trips. Uh, None of these men are necessarily uh, overtly Christian men. So you can imagine the things uh, that the guys would talk about and tell jokes and tell stories and things like this. And it wasn't unusual that there would be a sexualized theme uh, to the things the guys would discuss. There'd be jokes about sex and stories about sex. And I remember this one man in particular who I now understand, uh, you know, I would consider he was just an exceptionally lewd man, and he would freely talk about his infidelities. He was a married man, uh, but he apparently would rendezvous with different women and and have different exploits uh, with women, and then he would uh, quite freely tell these stories and tell different men what he was doing and these women he was meeting and things that would happen. And on this one particular trip, I remember that he began to talk to my dad, and he said to my dad, uh, my dad's name uh, was Angelo, Angelo, you know, uh, I could fix you up with this woman uh, if you wanted to meet her. You could have a rendezvous with her, you know. And uh, as they were talking, they began to quiet their voices like this, and they began to talk in a whisper, I guess apparently in the attempt to keep me, prevent me from hearing what they were saying. But of course, in the the close confines of a car, I mean, you know, 
were, were sitting almost right next to each other. I, I could hear what they were saying, and I knew what they were talking about because by this time I had been looking at the pornography for some time. I had been masturbating. I, I understood what sex was. It was coming onto my radar, so I knew what they were talking about. And I remember literally being horrified by this discussion. I, I was very, very upset by it. And I was very angry at this man for talking to my father about this. And I, I, I wanted to say, hey, you can't say this to my dad. Dad, don't don't talk about this. You can't do this. What about mom? I, I, I knew that this man was trying to make an arrangement for my father to meet some woman. And I was very upset by this, but I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, how is a young boy, you know, 11 or 12 years old going to confront four or five grown men? I, I didn't know what to say. So I simply didn't say anything, but, but I literally remember feeling very upset. Well, that evening when we got home from the trip, I, re- I remember my dad for real literally pulled me aside and he stuck his finger right in my face and he said, you better not ever say anything about anything you hear on these trips. If you ever say anything, then you're never going to go hunting with us again. And he kind of threatened me, I guess. And, uh, and I received the message and I never did say anything to anybody. Well, fast forward, I, I want to say uh, just a few words about my spiritual father. I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I became a true born-again Christian when I was 16 years old. Through a series of events, I got invited to go to this uh, non-denominational youth group Bible study, and I started going, and I thought it was really strange because there were young kids there my age that were literally carrying Bibles around, uh, and they were excited about God, and they'd sing songs about God and have Bible studies. And so I started going to this Bible study, and that's really where I came to understand the gospel for the first time in my life, who Jesus was and what he had actually done for me, that God loved me, and he sent his son Jesus to die for my sins on the cross so that I could gain these benefits through Christ, I could have the forgiveness of my sins. I could enter into a personal relationship with God. I could go to heaven when I die. And in the meantime, I could have a relationship with the living God. So when I understood the gospel, I, I embraced it. I, I I understood it for the first time in my life. I guess the, the dawn, the dawn of the, the, the light of God w- came into my heart and, and into my life. And I received Jesus as my Savior. I asked Jesus to come into my heart to be my Savior. And I became a Christian. And about that time, I began to go to this young church, and this man was a pastor at this church. And I really loved this man. He became my first pastor and my first spiritual mentor. And I looked up to this man, and I really loved him, and I trusted him, and I respected him. I think maybe in large part because of my own relationship with my father, which wasn't that, which wasn't that good. I was afraid of my dad. I, I think if I had a problem or, or an issue, I would never go to my dad to, to seek him out. But this man felt safe to me, and I could talk to this man, and this man liked me, and uh, I just uh, really enjoyed my relationship with this man. And... It was about this time that I also found my first girlfriend. Her name was Chris. Uh, I fell head over heels in love with her, and she was my first official girlfriend. And all this was happening in my life all at about the same time. I was 16 years old. I became a Christian. I met this man who was my first pastor, and I found my first girlfriend. And to make a long story short, what happened is that uh, I dated this girl all the way through my senior year in high school, and at the end of my senior year, I had decided I was going to go to Bible college. When I understood the gospel, I just it was like almost immediately I knew in my heart, this, this explains my life. This message explains the very purpose of my life, and I'm going to live for this message. 
I'm going to live for God. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I just like intuitively knew there was a calling on my life and that who Jesus was was going to affect me the the rest of my life. So I had decided I wanted to go to Bible school after high school, and I wanted to study to go into the ministry. And so after my senior year in high school, Chris and I graduated, and I went away to Bible school uh, for the first semester of college. Chris stayed in St. Louis. And to make a long story short, I'm not going to go in, into... Uh, <clears throat> and to make a long story short, and to make a long story short, I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but basically what happened that semester while I was away, my first semester of college, my pastor and my first pastor and my first girlfriend. Uh, fell into a sexual affair with one another, and my pastor began to have sex with my girlfriend. Well, as this story unfolds, I came home uh, for Christmas, the end of uh, my first semester, and my girlfriend quickly confided in me that she had been having sex with our pastor. And of course, I was horrified. I didn't know what to do. One thing led to the other, and uh, Chris had decided she was going to go back to Bible college with me. So we left together and we went to Bible college and uh, we left the St. Louis area. And I thought that would solve the the dilemma because she would be with me. We'd be in another state and uh, my pastor could no longer have sex with her. I, I felt too intimidated, too scared. I didn't know what to do, what to say to him. So I didn't say anything. And at this point, he didn't know that I knew, and I thought that would be the end of it. Well, unfortunately, he continued to pursue her, and he was writing these uh, love letters to her and different things. And in a short matter of time, I learned that he was coming down to the Bible school to visit. And of course, I knew uh, what his true motive was. He apparently was not relenting, and he was continuing to pursue his relationship with Chris. And at that point, I knew I had no option. I'm going to have to confront my my own pastor about his sin and what he's doing. And I remember asking him to uh, to talk to me if we could go for a walk. And I remember going for this on this walk with him, and I told him that I knew what was happening between him and Chris, and that, that it was wrong and that he had to stop doing this. And uh, I remember us talking, and I, I remember him telling me that that's why he had come down to the Bible school, so that he could terminate his relationship with her, which, of course, I was very suspicious of. I'm not sure that that was his true motive. But I remember him literally putting his arm around me and confiding in me, and saying, Tony, I, I need your confidence on this. No one can find out about this because if they do, uh, I could get in trouble. It could be the end of the church. A lot of people would be upset. So I need to trust you. Can I trust you with this secret? No one can ever find out about this. So it was years later that I really realized that that in his own way, my pastor did to me exactly what my father did when he pulled me aside and put his finger in my face and said, don't tell anybody about this. My pastor was now essentially teaching me the same thing. Tony, don't tell anybody about this. Nobody can find out about this. So you see, I believe that my physical father and my spiritual father, these two men held uh, positions of extreme influence in my young heart and life. And they were both providing what I believe were deeply negative uh, examples of sexuality, what a sexual man is. Or uh, in the verbiage of the title of this story, Story 5, Ungodly Role Models. You see, both men were showing me what a man is, what a man does with women, how a man thinks about women, uh, the kind of jokes that men tell about women, that, that men can do things with women and then keep secrets so that nobody uh, knows about these things. Now, the fact is, uh, I don't know 
that my father ever acted on what this man was suggesting. I, I have no reason to believe he did. And I give my father uh, the benefit of the doubt, but it doesn't change the fact that that uh, the influence of these men and the examples they were providing, uh, I think, were profoundly uh, negative and harmful in my young heart and soul. In fact, I think part of the harm is that the message were, messages were consistent with the images that I had been seeing in the pornography and the stories that I had been reading in the pornography. See, kind of the way men look at women, the way men talk to women, the way men treat women, the secrets that men have with women. And so my life was being affected uh, by these men, by these male role models of my life. Both my physical and my spiritual fathers provided uh, profoundly ungodly lessons for my young life concerning who and what a sexual man is supposed to be. And I might encourage you guys to just kind of think about this story. Like I said, I'm hopeful my story will be kind of a kind of template for you. So many men that I talk to uh, identify this as a, as a reality in their own story. You know, if you, th- if you think about who were the senior male role models in your life, who modeled what a man is to you? Who modeled what sex is? How a man thinks about sex and manages sex and talks about sex? You know, uh, one man that I know, uh, his uncle took him on his 13th birthday to a, uh, to a prostitute so that he could become a man. His uncle thought, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this surprise, and, and you're going to learn what it means to be a man. And his uncle, no doubt, thought he was blessing this boy, helping this boy, doing something good for this young boy. And uh, I would advocate that that was profoundly uh, harmful and a terrible thing to happen. But you see, the boy is learning from his uncle. His uncle is teaching him what a man is and, and, and what... Uh, sex is and how a man relates to sex and what women are and how to use women. And so many of us, you see, have had uh, rather horrible examples from the ungodly role models in our life. And that's uh, another component of the damage that's been done. Do you see in the metaphor of the cake mix, another ingredient getting put in there that uh, would be very, very counterproductive, if not at least destructive. And that brings me to story number six, which I call sexual abuse. And the fact is, when I was 14 years old, two older women came into my life, and both of them perpetrated sexual abuse against me. And I'm going to share one of those stories with you. You know how a family uh, will typically find a kid in the neighborhood, a young teenage boy or girl, to babysit for them? Well, there was this family that didn't live too far from us, and I would babysit for them on occasion. Of course, they were married, and they had two young kids. And uh, I went over their house to to babysit uh, this particular occasion, and something was wrong, although I didn't understand it at the time. I, in retrospect, I believe this couple had a terrible marriage because they would uh, get in fights a lot. I saw them fight many times. And on this particular occasion, they got in this big fight. I'm at their house to babysit. And so she stampedes out of the house. She throws the kids in the car and, and me, and we leave, and I figure she's taken me home because obviously they're not going out on a date. And she drives and drives, and I realize we're not going home, and I I didn't know where where we were going. And of all things, after a while, she drives and pulls into this drive-in movie theater. And after we get to the drive-in, she puts her kids out on a blanket next to the car, so this this leaves her and I in the car. And by the way, uh, this woman was stunningly beautiful. I remember hanging around her, and I quickly uh, realized I could perceive, even as a young boy, the power that this woman had over men. Uh, If we were in a grocery store or here or there, I could just see men literally would stop and turn and just watch her 
and look at her walk by. She was a very, very beautiful woman, and uh, she had this obvious uh, power over the men around her. And because of this, I myself, uh, of course, recognized her beauty. I'd been looking at pornography, and I guess I kind of had a crush on her in my heart. So when we get to this drive-in, she puts the kids uh, outside the car, and we're sitting uh, in the front seat of the car. The car had bucket seats. She's by the steering wheel. I'm in the passenger side. And after a bit, she says to me, I think we should get in the back seat of the car uh, because uh, it, it would be more comfortable. So she gets me in the back seat of the car, and then she says, let's scoot in the middle, sit, sit next to me in the middle, so that we can see because the bucket seats were on each side so we could kind of look in between the bucket seats through the windshield of the car to see the movie. So she's kind of snuggling me in the back seat of this car and she has this blanket and she puts the blanket over the top of us and we're watching this movie. And you guys, I remember the movie very clearly because of what happened. It was the movie The Godfather which uh, in retrospect, I think, was uh, rather inappropriate for, of course, the entire situation's terribly inappropriate for her to even bring a young teenage boy to see The Godfather. But uh, there's this scene in the movie, you'll remember, where Michael, uh, the, the other people kill Sonny, Michael's brother, so my, uh, they, the, the family hatches a plan, and Michael's going to go to the restaurant and uh, meet with, uh, I think it's the police chief and this other guy. Anyway, Michael's going to shoot these two guys, and he does so. He shoots these two guys in the restaurant, and then he flees to Sicily to go into hiding. And while he's in Sicily, he meets this beautiful young Sicilian girl. They fall in love, and they, they end up getting married. And the scene in the movie is the, the wedding night, uh, that Michael mar- marries this young Sicilian girl. The wedding is over. He gets her up in the bridal chamber, and he closes the windows, and he approaches her, and she's a, a beautiful young woman, and she has, like, this nightgown on, and as he approaches her, he he pulls the straps off of her shoulders, and the nightgown falls down, and uh, she's naked, and you can see her breasts. You can see from the waist up. Now, you guys can imagine, this would be a stunning scene for me to see, even today. Uh, It might take my breath away if I saw this scene as a 58-year-old man. Can you imagine a 10-year, not 10, a 14-year-old boy seeing a scene like this, let alone in the backseat of a car with a beautiful woman covered up, snuggling in a blanket, And as the scene is unfolding, this woman whispers to me, would you like me to take off my shirt for you? Would you like to see me? And I'm going to stop the story there because I'm not sure I need to go into uh, a lot of detail. And the fact is, I'm a little bit cloudy exactly what happened in the backseat of that car but whatever happened, I, I know, was uh, was profoundly inappropriate, and I came to understand later um, would certainly constitute sexual abuse. And the point I want to make, guys, is that I, I believe these situations uh, were very, very hurtful in my young heart and soul. The fact is, uh, this particular woman, this wasn't the only incident there were several, at least several different incidents with her that, that I think were very inappropriate. The way she would talk to me, the way she would touch me, uh, places that she took me uh, certainly would constitute sexual abuse. And I think what's very sad to look back and think about is that these were the very first sensual experiences I had with another human being. How sad that this would be true for a young boy. And I believe that these situations were exceptionally hurtful to me, harmful, because of the messages that they embedded in my young heart and soul. Uh, For one thing, I was learning that real women are like the the women, apparently, in the magazines and the books. Real women like to do the things that that I heard the men talk about on the rabbit hunting trips, you see. 
real women like to mess around and do inappropriate things and be uh, uh, treated uh, sexually. I, I knew that this woman was married. I knew that you're not supposed to do that if you're married. So I was learning that, you see, sexuality isn't just about love and respect and faithfulness and boundaries, but really it's about lust and selfishness and betrayal. And I'm seeing reflections in the, in the male role models around my life and now in this woman, the way people think about sex and what they do about sex and the, the choices they make. And I think it's really sad uh, that a boy's very first sensual experiences would be so profoundly unholy and ungodly. And guys, that brings me to the end of this episode. Uh, tune in next time, and we'll continue my story from there. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. Visit powerofpurity.org for more resources and information. And if this podcast has been helpful or encouraging, please invite a friend to listen. Until next time, remember, there's power in purity.